than Seven Cannon Art, don't get me wrong, but we gotta talk about this first. So Awaken the Erstwhile is three generic mana and two black for a rare sorcery. It says each player discards all the cards in their hand, then creates that many 2-2 two -two black zombie creature tokens. So, and mm, it's very, it's so situational. Um, like, first of all, you have to have more cards in your hand than your opponent. Okay. Um, you have to have the ability to take advantage of those cards going to your graveyard very quickly. Um, and the zombies your opponent controls are going to be able to attack first. Because you create these, yours have summoning sickness, then it goes to your opponent's turn, they have theirs and can attack with them if they want. So this doesn't help you in a board stall. You either you, you kind of have to be already winning or at parity with your opponent for this to be good. Um, because this is going to set up your later turns. I'm aware of, of like the green, black, graveyard shenanigans. Um, but this is going to take some setup to, to, to work well. And that's what can... It's either going to work real well because you're already at a solid place, or it's going to hurt you a lot. Um, because it'll put your opponent at, like, at, at worst, this lets your opponent attack you and, and you mill a bunch of stuff you can't take advantage of right away and your opponent just runs away with it from there. At best, you were already kind of winning, this helps you win faster. So, I'm limited, I, I, I'm kind of, the, it's kind of the same way on it. If you have a handful of cards, which you ideally don't want to do... Um, you get rid of them all and turn them into zombies. But so does your opponent. Yeah, I just... I can't see myself playing this, unfortunately. Uh, it's more of a Golgari card than anything. The Erstwhile or, or Golgari uh, peoples. So in, if the flavor text talks about that. In preparation for the conflict, all foresaw the Golgari called upon an army that had slept for millennia beneath the city. So... Um, but we'll get on to the next card. I'm just not real high on Awaken the Erstwhile. Again, very open to being wrong. I want all these cards to work. I want there to be a bunch of different kind of decks in the format and everybody have fun. Um, but I just don't see it with this one. Bankrupt in Blood, Seb McKinnon, Moi. Uh, generic and a black for a uncommon sorcery. As additional cost to cast a spell, sacrifice two creatures to draw three cards. Um, if you're playing Orzhov, you want to sack stuff. You will have the creatures to sack. You will have the afterlife things. And this lets you draw into more things. Um... I would only play one. Like, you don't want to play a bunch of these, because that means you're sacking too many of your creatures, probably. Um, but having one in the one of these in my hand to versatilely draw cards when I when I want to, solid choice for me. Also, this guy. If you haven't checked out Seb McKinnon's art, just... He's all over, like... He has his own website and everything. Just, just look at his art, for goodness sakes. Basilica Bellhaunt is our Orzhov 2 and 2. It costs two white and two black for an uncommon spirit. It is a 3-4. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card, and you gain three. Three, to me, is the minimum amount that matters. Uh, and three, four body for four is fine. Uh, this is probably the middle of these uh, of these two and two creatures. Uh, whereas, we'll see, to me, Gruels is the best. We'll see that later on. Um, this is probably about the middle. Again, you have to be Solid Orzhov to play it, but if you are Solid Orzhov, you're playing it every time. Uh, Blade Brand is a generic and a black for a black instant card. For a common instant card. Uh, Terror Creature gains Death Touch and Tender and Draw a card. So this is essentially a removal spell. Um, you're going to give this to your creature that is blocking your opponent's creature, and your opponent's creature is going to die. Yours probably will too, so you technically got two for one, but this replaces itself because it draws a card. I've played these before, I will play this one, and it will kill my opponent's creatures just like the other ones have. Blade Juggler is four generic mana and a black for a common human rogue. It is a 3-2 with spectacle two and a black. Uh, we'll just continue. Blade Juggler enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to you, and you draw a card. So what Spectacle does is you may cast this spell for its spectacle cost rather than its mana cost if an opponent lost life this turn. 
excuse me. Um, so what that means is if your opponent lost life, however, whether you already attacked them, whether you pinged them, whether you burned them, whatever, um, you can cast this card for its spectacle cost. The rules as to when you can cast this card still apply. So it's a creature, so main phase. You can't flash it in because it doesn't have flash. Um, but it's a 3-2 for spectacle. You've, I don't know that you much want to cast this for its regular cost. You always want to try and spectacle this. Sometimes spectacle is just extra value on an already good body. This is just more just good if you can cast spectacle. Don't get me wrong, I'm going to cast a 3-2 if I need to, but uh, I really want to try and get this off for the spectacle cost to get the value out of it. Blood Mist Infiltrator is 2 and a black for a 3-1. Whenever it attacks, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, it can't be blocked this turn. So 3-1 that can't be blocked is very quickly going to chip your opponent down as long as you can keep sacking things to it. So you can feed this thing um, your, your spirits if your opponent has some flying blockers. Feed this your spirits so it can get in there. Um, in your Orzhov deck, I think this does some work. In what's the other black color of this go around? In Rakdos... Um, Rakdos doesn't create as much tokens. It can, um, with some goblin creating cards, but it's not as good at it as Orzhov. So keep in mind it's a 3 1 for, for 3 is overcosted from what we've seen before. Uh, but if you have enough cards to make, to make tokens or to make sacking for this effective, good on you. Carry an imp is three generic mana and a black for a common imp. It's a two three flyer, uh, which we have talked about before about being playable on its own. So is this guy. Carry an imp has the extra ability that when it enters the battlefield, you may exile target creature from a graveyard. If you do, you gain two, right? So that's just kind of two three flyer for four is fine. You get to gain a couple life, cool. Uh, and maybe it's something their opponent was going to try to like bring back to their hand. So just added benefit. You want their bomb you killed earlier to stay dead? This will make it stay dead. Catacomb Crocodile, four generic mana and a black for a three-seven common crocodile. When when you need absolutely positively need to block everything, this will help you block everything. Uh, again, love me the flavor text on this. It's kind of a little mini mini kid story. I am sewer. I am sewer king. Said Rat. I am quick and cunning and know every tunnel. No, I am sewer. I am king. Said Zombie, I am cold and deadly, and no rot can harm me. Then Croc came and ate them both. Alright, just like that. And rats are usually like 1 1s or something 1s, and Zombies are usually 2 2s, so the 3 power could eat them both. Right? So, ah, I like it. But I would also play this as a 5, because your black deck sometimes, especially in Orzhov, your Orzhov decks are usually going to play longer games and come up the ground a little bit, which Catacomb Crocodile is pretty good at doing. Clear the stage. Four Jarek Men and a black. For a uncommon instant, target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. If you control a creature with power four greater, also known as Ferocious, you may return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah, there's a... Um, there's a... What is it? There's a 5-5 five, five with Riot? Or a 5-5 five, five with Adapt 1. Essentially, you can kind of build your own Colossal Dreadmaw, so it blocks that, is my only thought. Oh. Um, so clear the stage. This is a instant kill an early creature in black. So I'm going to take this. Removal. Again, bombs. Removal. Removal is second in order to bombs, because that's how you kill their bombs. So take it. Um, worst case, you kill their thing. Best case, you kill their thing and get one of yours back. So, I'm take this. I'll be happy with it. So will you. And our first Orzhov split card is Consecrate and Consume. Consecrate is generic mana and a white or black. Uh, so a Orzhov hybrid for an instant uncommon. And I love the art on this. The art on this looks like an old school Orzhov card. Like, looks like an original Ravnica art on really both halves of this. Um, so the card text itself <laughs> says, Exile target card from graveyard, draw a card instant, um, white and or black, drawing a card that costs you nothing as long as your opponent has a creature in their graveyard. So, good in those colors. They're trying to figure out more ways to give white card draw, and uh, I'm fine with that. 
Uh, second half is Consume. For two generic mana, a black and a white. It's a uncommon sorcery. Second half is a sorcery. Note that. Target player sacrifices a creature with the greatest power among creatures they control. You gain life equal to its power. So this... I can see this this card seeing standard just on the strength of Consume. This kills Colossal, Colossal Dreadmaws dead. Right? If you've played against green at all uh, since that card has come out, you can see how a Consume would be handy. They play Colossal Dreadmaw, you're like, what am I gonna do? It has Hexproof, and I couldn't counter it. You draw Consume, and you're like, that's what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna gain seven while I'm at it. Um, I really like this card. Gonna see standard play, in my opinion, uh, because it kills Colossal Dreadmaws and a lot of big Hexproofy angels and all kinds of stuff. Um, the good thing about this is... It's, well, it's sorcery speed, so even against the Gruul card that gives your opponent Hexproof on their turn, um, can't do, you can still play Consume against that, right? And they can sacrifice their, their biggest thing. But I do really like this card. Gonna see standard play, and it's removal. It's removal and card draw. Two really valuable things, so play it in limited, and you're gonna enjoy yourself there as well. Kills your opponent's biggest thing. What else can you want, right? Speaking of killing things, consign to the pit. Also kills your opponent's biggest thing for two more mana. This is a destroy target creature, consigned to the pit, deals two damage to that creature's controller. Again, black white is are the best colors at just kill that, just get rid of that. Whether it's exiling something, whether it's just killing something like consigned to the pit here, black white are the colors to go in if you want to do that. That's one of the reasons why I went in there and the the potential to basically I want to go Mardu is my plan, and I think going Orzhov main is better for that than going Rakdos main. My reasoning. Uh, consigned to the Pit says destroy target creature. Consigned to the Pit deals two damage to that creature's controller. I already read that. It's six mana. It's a common sorcery, and that's how you kill things in uh, in limited in this set at common. So, again, removal, take it. The Cry of the Carnarium. This is one generic mana and two black for an ins for a sorcery at uncommon. It says all creatures get minus two minus two until the end of turn. Exile all creature cards and all graveyards that were put there from the battlefield this turn. If a creature would die this turn, exile it instead. Now here's where you want to be careful. This is much more a Rakdos card than an Orzhov card. If you're playing Orzhov and you're like, I'm going to play this, this will trigger my, my, my afterlife. No, it won't. Afterlife happens on dies. This replaces the dies trigger with exiling it. So your afterlife will not go off. Be very, very careful with that. Um... So this, to me, is more of a Rakdos card because of that. Um, but yeah, you want to be very, very careful. This, to me, a card that Rakdos wants to play against Orzhov um, in order to get rid of all their flying tokens and creatures that can create afterlife. So this is... Ooh, excuse me. This is a card that could very much hose my, my Orzhov strategy if I'm not careful. And for that reason, and it's just a... can potentially be a big board wipe. And while um, not the, always the best... In limited can be very good if you can manage the board state correctly, attack into their, bo their board, a bunch of things bounce, and trade off hopefully benefits you after you play this. But I still like it, uh, and I would still include it in my deck. Dead Rebels, awesome card here. Three generic man and a black for a common sorcery uh, that says return up to two target creature cards from your graveyard to your hand with a spectacle cost of a generic and a black. So for potentially two mana, you can get two creature cards back from your graveyard to your hand. Doesn't matter their type, they don't have to be pirates, they can be any creature. Um, and for that reason, it's a really good card. So especially with the uh, redundancy of afterlife, I can sack a couple afterlife things to other stuff, bring them back with dead revels, play them again, get their afterlife triggers again if I want to, if they die, and just keep going from there. So dead revels is a card, and this kind of effect can be really good um, in just limited in general. Your opponent kills something of yours, you get to play this card, even if you don't ping them. You can just play this, get your big bombs back, maybe play one of them that turn, uh, then your big card the next turn, and you've just, oh, that's nice, you killed those. With one card, I brought them back. Right? Um, for that reason, I like Dead Rebels, and even better if you can spectacle it in. Next up, I love the art. Just the art on this is so creepy. Uh, look at its hands. It has people hands. Um, Debtor's Transport is five generic mana and a black. Like, look at this. Look at its hands. It has people hands. Uh, five generic mana and a black for common thrall. It has afterlife two, and it's five three. Uh, so this is solid afterlife card. It has a big body to trade with big uh, gruel things, big simic things. 
And after it trades, it's going to leave behind a couple of flying spirits, which is not a bad thing. So if you're looking at this, look at these, the art and think about it for a sec. All right, the people hands, all that kind of stuff. And then look at the flavor text. By design, the sarcophagus muffles the debtor's moans, but does not silence them. Orzhov being creepy. Drill bit. Oh, I'm gonna the 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 Rakdos puns. The Rakdos puns. Drill bit is two uh, generic mana and a black, very uncommon sorcery. It says target player reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card. And a spectacled cost is a single black mana. So if you can ping your opponent, which we'll see there is a pinger in this set, or somehow make them lose life, this is Thoughtseize. Don't get me wrong, it was very potentially not Thoughtseize as well. Um, it is uh, something that has to be enabled. So, still solid, um, these kinds of, rev your opponent reveals their card, their hand, you pick something, they discard it. It's not that, it's anything. It could be their big bomb removal spell, their big creature, their big enchantment, whatever it is, you just get rid of it. Um, and for the potential for it to be Thoughtseize, without having to pay the life... Aquirophilia? I don't know what that is. I, I, I don't know what that is. I need an explanation. Um, while you're looking that up and googling the definition for me... I don't, not that, just it's weird that it has people hands, because it looks like a big, like, cow or something, but it has people hands. It's weird. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry, distraction. Anyway, drill bit. I just want, last thing I want to mention about this card is the, the flavor text. So it's drill bit. If, you, if you're just listening, you're not looking at the art. Basically, a Rakdos guy has a big drill to the guy's head, but the guy's blindfolded, so he can't see. And the whole thing about Rakdos is they're a big circus. They're entertaining, but they're a very messy circus. It's like going to a Gallagher show, but it's actually a guy's head. Um, so Drill Bit has a flavor text. Never boring. Anyway. Speaking of big balmy enchantments, Ethereal Absolution is four generic mana, a white and a black for a rare enchantment. It says creatures you control get plus one, plus one. Creatures your opponents control get minus one, minus one. Also has the ability to for two generic mana, a white and a black. Exile target creature card from an opponent's graveyard. If it was a creature card, you create a one, one white and black spirit token creature with flying. Um, this card's real good. Um, you know how Elish Norn is a really good card? This is Elish Norn, but it's harder to remove. I know it's on minus two, minus two, and plus two, plus two, but for a limited environment, it might as well be. And what, you killed your opponent's creatures earlier in the game? Okay, now you get to exile them and turn them into flying spirits. Flying two, two spirits, mind you. What's that? Your opponents are playing X ones, they instantly die. Your opponents have, like, one, three flyers. Those are now zero twos, which you're... Two two spirits can kill all day. This is the bomb. Absolutely play it if you're anywhere near these colors. It is a single black and a single white to activate, so you can easily splash it in either Rakdos. Rakdos would love this uh, to pump up their their undersized, slightly undersized creatures. Um, or Azorius would also love this to just further pump up the toughness of their bigger creatures and shrink their opponents. Um, so splash this play this, it's just a good card for Ethereal Absolution. Also, good commander. <laughs> uh, Font of Agonies, also a good card um, in commander. Imagine that. Black, Font of Agonies, sorry, is a bl single black mana for a rare enchantment. Whenever you pay life, put that many blood counters on Font of Agonies. You may pay a one generic mana and a black to remove four blood counters from Font of Agonies to destroy target creature. So, um, there is a little bit of pay life stuff. There's a removal spell where you can pay five life. Um, there are a few other things we'll run into as we go in both Orzhov and Rakdos where you can pay life. I don't know that there's enough um, to make make Font of Agonies worth it, unless you, in, depending on your pool, uh, that's this is the card where it depends heavily on your pool because you need life gain uh, in order to enable yourself to pay life because you have to pay at least four life to be able to pay two to kill something, right? Um, so in order to enable yourself to pay life, you have to pay enough, or sorry, you have to gain enough life. But, but, um, that where it, that's where it really depends on how much you get in your pool. 
if that you don't, you just can't play this. If you barely get any life gain or barely get any cards where you have to pay life, you just can't play it. And that's that's where you're at. Um, so Fountain of Agonies may be a slightly disappointing card to, to open in your pre-release. Later on, especially with our third set we're going to get, when Nook Bowls finally shows up, this may be playable, but we'll have to wait and see. Not not at the moment. Um, the reason I say we may to wait till Nicol Bolas is because he features in the flavor text of this card where he says, no worthwhile reward is easily gained. It's kind of cool. An awesome uh, job on this Jason Angle on the art on this as well is really cool. Reminds me of uh, Debt to the Deathless. Grasping Thrall, solid card. Three generic mana for uh, plus a white and a black for a common Thrall. It's a 3-3 with flying. When it enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to each opponent, and you gain two life. Uh, I have not yet. Have they even said it yet? I haven't heard it yet. Uh, da -da -da -da. So, Grasping Thrall here. So for four mana, we've seen quite a number of two, three flyers for four mana. Your opponent plays that, you play this, and you say, come at me, bro, because they can't anymore. Um, unless they have the, the Simic one that grows into a 3-4, and you're like, oh. Um, but still, I'm going to play Grasping Thrills. I'm not going to be a 3-3 three, three flyer for 5, it's fine. One that shocks and heals you is also fine. War of the Spark. Oh, yeah, 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 I did see that. They just announced that like 2-3 days ago. Um, yeah, because Liliana... She, Bolas, basically, she got rid of her her pact with the demons, but Bolas says, I'm actually the contract holder for that. Um, del delving into some magic lore here. Liliana signed a pact with demons in order to kind of live forever. Um, the demons tried to call her debt, but one by one she slew them all, or with the help of the guild, the other people, she slew them all. But then when they were all gone, they're like, oh, your contract's defaulted. And Bolas is like, actually, I hold the contract. Come with me now, or you're dead. Um, that's where the art from Bolus's clutches and the flavor text of it is from. So, um, Liliana, what's she gonna do now? Because basically, Bolus and Liliana are coming to Ravnica. What's gonna happen? That's what's what the the, the story wise is about. So, we'll find out. So, whose spark are we warring over? You know, that's is it Liliana's spark? Is Liliana gonna die? We're going to kill Bolas. Bolas has been a bad guy forever, so it's really cool what's going to happen story-wise in, uh, in War for the Spark. I'm actually really excited to see. Uh, all right, so anyway, going on from Grasping Thrill. Grotesque Demise. Two generic mana and a black for a common instance as Exile target creature with power three or less. How many, when we were going over Azorius, how many creatures had power three or less? A lot. Uh, so far in this, how many creatures have had power three or less? A lot. Not a lot of Gruel Will. Some, some of the early stuff will, but not a lot. A lot of it's big. Some of, a lot of the Simic stuff did before it uh, adapted, right? So this is going to kill a lot of the Rakto stuff Stuff does as well. So this is going to kill a lot of things. Enough for me to include one. Gutter Bones. Uh, Loading Ready Runs preview card. Good old Gutter Bones. I love the, just the art and the semi-funny thing of this. Um, so it's Gutter Bones is a single black mana for a rare skeleton warrior... Uh, Gutter Bones enters the field, battlefield tapped, and it's a 2 1, and has generic and a black mana to return Gutter Bones from your graveyard to your hand. Activate this ability uh, only during your turn and only if an opponent lost life this turn. So essentially, kind of spectacle, you can activate this ability. Um, it's because that. So, because of a few things, I'm not a big Gutter Bones fan because it's so conditional. Because it enters tapped, dies very easily because of the 1 toughness. And you have to do a no jump through a number of hoops to get it back to your hand. And even then, just to your hand, not even to the battlefield. It's not a Blood Soak Champion, where it returns to the battlefield tapped. Um, so because of that, unfortunately, not a big fan of Gutter Bones. There's not a lot of one-drops in Limited. So, yeah, I would, I would still play it, but there's a number of hoops you have to jump through. Don't expect to constantly have this constantly recur and recur and recur, um, because it needs some hoops. It needs some hoops. Ill-gotten inheritance. Three generic mana and the black for a common enchantment. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, ill-gotten inheritance deals one damage to each opponent and you gain one life. For five generic mana and a black, you can sacrifice ill-gotten inheritance. It deals four damage target opponent and you gain four life. Um, I, okay. I've talked several times in the review so far about playing do nothing cards. Cards when they enter the battlefield and for that turn, do nothing. Uh, that's what this does. In my opinion, 
this one does enough to warrant itself being played. So if you've played a couple, um, you know, low power, high toughness creatures or cards and things that will trade off, you can get away with doing this on your fourth turn, because even if your opponent attacks you for three, say, uh, on their turn four, uh, you can, you'll gain one and drain one, then play out your turn five threat and gain one and drain one, and then play a turn six threat and gain one, drain one, and gain one, drain one, gain one, drain one, and then eventually gain four, drain four. And that's good enough to me to, to earn a spot back. It catches you up and then gains you ground later in the game. So to me, I would play a single, only ever a single copy of Ill-Gotten Inheritance. Imperious Oligarch is your uh, another one of your really top tier afterlife cards. It is a white and black mana for a common human cleric. It's a 2-1 with Vigilance with an Afterlife 1. Um, Vigilance is really nice in Limited, like we've talked about before. Don't underestimate that. Um, early drops in Limited are also really good, especially in Sealed. People might not always have those, so you might be able to even attack and get in with this one. Um, and the Afterlife trigger is just good. So... Ideally, you can get in with for this with two once, um, come back, you'll be able to block something from Gruul, um, and then this will die, the Gruul thing will probably live, and then you'll have that 1-1 one, one flyer to chip in later on as well. Um, so I'm playing Imperius Oligarch. Even if I'm Rakdos, I'm probably playing it. Azorius, it's maybe a little more questionable, uh, but I'm still I'm playing Imperius Oligarch if I'm Orzhov. Yes, please. Probably two, not more than two, though. Uh, here's a, a very a card we've been talking a lot about. If you're in chat or if you're watching this on YouTube, I'd love to hear your comment section, uh, your comments about this. So we'll go over it first, then we'll talk about it. So Kaya, or Jav Usurper, is a generic, a white and a black, for a mythic, as uh, a legendary planeswalker, Kaya. She enters with three loyalty. Uh, her plus one ability has exile up to two target cards from a single graveyard. You gain two life if at least one creature card was exiled this way. She has minus one. Exile target non-land permanent with converted mana cost one or less. Just exile it. Uh, minus five. Kaya deals damage to target player equal to the number of cards that player owns in exile, and you gain that much life. Uh, I agree with chat. <laughs> or at least Barrack in chat. Uh, so, so bad. I... I keep trying to, like, we talked about Dovin and the potential home Dovin has. I don't see a home for Kaya. First of all, okay. So plus, let's go over her abilities one by one. X off to two target cards from a single graveyard. So up to two. Okay, cool. Uh, you gain two life uh, if at least one creature card was exiled this way. Okay, so she doesn't protect herself with her plus one. She simply goes up to four. Yes, she's a turn three walker that goes up to four, potentially. But still. Um, and you gain two life. Two life is not enough to me. The two life doesn't buy you a turn. Um, you have to do it at twice, at least, maybe even three times until it buys you a turn. Minus one is exile target non-land permanent with converted mana cost one or less. So it's non-land, so you can't get rid of the flip land. And that said, um, any non-basic land permanent. So if you could get rid of your opponent's like flipped as Kanta, even, hey, that'd be fine. Um, or, yeah, no, it, 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 it's not going to see any kind of vintage or modern play. I don't see it. Um, it would see modern play if it was, like, minus four, because you could plus one, then minus four ultimate her, and you could get maybe somebody who's playing Delver, um, if they've delved a lot of cards away. Maybe? like, But even then, that's not this card. That's a card we're making up. Um, her ultimate... It deals damage to target player equal to the number of cards that player owns in exile, and you gain that much life. So you plus one, plus one. So keep in mind, let's play her on turn three. The opponent's probably going to have nothing in their graveyard. Okay, let's play her on turn seven. Um, this is only good in a board stall. Um, the only time I can see this being good is very late in a control deck where you're already ahead because you can't protect yourself. And if, in that case, it's just a win more. It's just an alternate win condition. Um, this, I'm even hesitant to play this in... I can't believe I'm saying this for a Planeswalker, but I'm hesitant to play this in Sealed, even. Um, first of all, if you do play it in Sealed, um, do not play her on turn three. 
because you're not going to get any fuel for her ultimate. Play her on turn at least six, seven, eight, um, where she will have stuff to exile. Once that happens, I would... You can minus five her and then maybe do four and gain four. Eh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Kai. I'm just not feeling it. Like, maybe sealed, but you have to play her properly in sealed. Normally, a planeswalker in sealed is just play. What's that? I can play this. Okay, I'm gonna play this now, and then just go off and win and have good times with a planeswalker. But Kaya, as a planeswalker, needs work to be good, and not not even like work as in okay, we got to find the right slot for. Her, as in. She needs a lot of other things to be good. And like we said earlier with a couple of other cards, any times you got to jump through hoops to make cards good, they become much, much less good. So again, i uh, love to hear you guys, if you're watching this on YouTube, talk down in the comment section. If you find a spot where you think she's good, or in chat, if you're watching, if you found a spot where you think she's good, mention it. I hope I'm wrong. Like I said earlier, I want all cards to be good, just I don't see Kaya here being good. Or... Kaya's Wrath, on the other hand... I do see being good and seeing all kinds of standard play while it's standard legal. It is two white and two black for a rare sorcery. It says destroy all creatures. You gain life equal to the number of creatures you controlled that were destroyed this way. Um, I, can, I like the flavor of this because Kaya is taking over um, Orzhov. Just like we saw with her planeswalk, she's taking over Orzhov. So she is gaining life from all the Orzhov things she's killing. So you don't gain life for your opponent's creatures, you gain life for yours. Um, and ideally, if you're playing this, you have a lot of afterlife creatures, so you wipe the board, and all of a sudden you have four to six spirits left over floating there, and your opponent's just like, ugh. So, ideally, we... we I, board wipes... I'm still playing a board wipe in, in Sealed, because, especially in Orzhov, because of the afterlife mechanic. I just throw my opponent's creatures, and I have, like I said, four to six spirits left over floating there. Then I get a ping in for a couple turns and probably win. That's fine. Um, but yeah, Kai's Wrath. Standard. It's gonna see play. Don't get me wrong there. Um, next up, Knight of the Last Breath is five generic mana, a white and a black for an uncommon giant knight. It is a creature. Uh, it's a 4-4. Four, four, has three generic mana ability. Sacrifice another non-token creature. Create a 1-1 one, one white and black spirit creature token with flying. Uh, also has afterlife three. Uh, sorry, one sec here, guys. It's a hard, fun part of doing it live. Uh, okay. Sorry, it has afterlife three as well. So, this is going to be one of your sack outlets for later in the game. Uh, so this, the neat thing about Knight of the Last Breath here is that you can sacrifice your afterlife cards to it, and then it adds one, essentially, because when you sacrifice something, you get to make a white and black spirit token creature with flying. And also, on its own, has afterlife three. So you can sack, use this as your sack outlet later in game. If your opponent is really grummed up the ground, you can sack things to this in order to jump over with a bunch of spirits. Um, you can even, if you have a bunch of soldier tokens, just turn them into spirits. right? And if this does happen to die, it pays off because it then gives you a bunch more spirits. So your opponent really has to think about their choices. This is going to draw out removal, don't get me wrong. Your opponent really has to think out their choices because do they want you to have this or do they want you to have spirits? They're going to do the best thing in their situation for them. Obviously, they're going to let you keep this. They're going to kill and give you spirits because who knows. But uh, Knight of the Last Breath is a really good limited card. It's expensive for a 4-4, four, four, but it's the abilities that earn it its spot. Mortify. Gorgeous art here from Anthony Palewood. I believe it says. Yeah. Palum Palumbo. Anthony Palumbo. Sorry. Butchered. Uh, Mortify, if you're not familiar, is a generic, a white and a black for your uncommon instant. Destroy target creature and enchantment. Bam. Just just play it. Play everyone you get. Play everyone. Draft everyone you see. Play everyone you draft. Play everyone you got in sealed. It's splashable in Azorius. It's splashable in Rakdos. Just play it. Good removal is good. It's versatile removal and good removal. And yep, I don't know what else to tell you guys, but this is gorgeous art though too. Like, look at that. Um, Mortify is good. Again, bombs removal. Second step. Noxious Grudion is two generic mana and a black for a 2 2 death touch. It's an uncommon, or sorry, it's a uh, common creature, is a beast. 
I love me some death touch creatures in limited. You get your small death touch creatures will hold back their big four fours, five fives, six sixes all day because they won't want to attack into it because they don't want to trade their expensive creature for your cheap little creature. Right? Even if and you're feeling a little gutsy, you can even get in there with them and make them make the choice. Right? So uh, I'd gladly play a couple of these. Uh, no more than two, because I also want my three mana creatures to be doing some other stuff too, but uh, a couple of Noxious Grudions would be very welcome in my deck. Urshav Enforcer is generic mana in a black. For an uncommon human rogue, it's a 1-2 with Death Touch and Afterlife 1. Uh, again, what did I just say about Death Touch things? So here we, again, uh, see what Wizards thinks about the Afterlife mechanic. So we see, okay, it's a 1-2 with Death Touch for two. In Afterlife 1. So they think that Afterlife is good enough to put on this. This, in my opinion, is another one of the very good Afterlife creatures. This makes our opponent's decisions about attacking even that much more difficult. And also, do they want to shock this to remove it? Or, you know, do what it, two damage or whatever to destroy it to remove it so their big creature can attack? If it can, then they're going to get swung back at in the air, right? Or it's not really even removing a blocker, it's just putting a 1 1 without Death Touch in the way because of the afterlife mechanic. So, if you can't tell, I kind of like afterlife just because it makes your opponent's decisions that much more complicated. But Orshav Enforcer, just like the Rudion, yes please. Orshav Racketeers is four generic mana and a black for a 3-2. Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card. So, this is kind of fun because you get to be a little more aggressive with this card. You get to be a little rakdos for Orshav with this card because you get to attack with a 3-2 and then your opponent decides king. Okay, do I want to let this hit me and discard one of my cards? Or do I want to block this, kill it, and give my opponent two 1-1 one -one flyers? Right? Put the decision on your opponent. Be a, not a lot of Orzhov cards are aggressive. This one is. Recognize the difference and be aggressive with it. Uh, Pestilent Spirit is two generic mana and a black for a rare spirit. It is a 3-2 with Menace and Death Touch. So instant sorcery spells you control have Death Touch. Um, this is one of the reasons I want to go Orzhov and then splash into Rakdos. Because my, okay, you have a nice 6-6, six, six, two damage to it, it's dead. Granted, it's rare, I might very well not, not pull it. Um, but that ability is so, so good. Um, also, the Menace and Death Touch. So, think about it for two seconds. You attack your opponent, they have to block with two things if they want to block it. You assign one damage, two damage, both of those die because both of those damage rounds have Death Touch attached to them. So you're two for one in your opponent, while you can also like play this turn five and just like, you know, two damage to that, K that's dead also because this has Death Touch, this Shock has Death Touch now. Um, definitely, obviously, bomb and limited, you know, seal, draft, whatever, play it. Um, potentially in standard and kind of that, in kind of that Mardu aristocrats, not necessarily the Aristocrat Shell, but in some kind of Mardu uh, or Jund deck, because this gives all your red just direct damage spells, uh, maybe even a, like a red-black burn, but red-black burn usually wants to burn your face, not your creatures, um, because it gives all those death touch, and that's just really, really good value. Yes, Cosmotronic Wave. I knew, I remember there was a combo, but yeah. Cosmotronic Wave against, like, a big giant Gruul board or a big giant Jund board. Everything dies. I kind of still want to Chain Whirler and give a Death Touch. I still want to do that. <laughs> Pitiless Pontiff is a white and a black for a uncommon vampire cleric. It is a 2 2. So, bear, let's hear about its upside. Uh, it is a one generic mana to sacrifice another creature. The Pitiless Pontiff gains death touch and indestructible until end of turn. So, here's one of our better sack outlets for Orzhov, where you're, where you're going to sack your your um, afterlife creatures too. Uh, and this, it's not, it is not um, Cartel Aristocrat. It's not a free sack, but it's as close, I think, as we're going to get this go around. Um, they realized that that was maybe a little too good. So this is as good as we're going to get. Um, that as well, Cartel gained protection from color of your choice. This gains indestructible. Uh, so, you know, exile or minus counter effects or minus toughness effects will still kill it. Um, so it's a it's a semi-fixed version. But, you know, being an old Aristocrats player, I, I liked Cartel Aristocrat just fine. <laughs> but anyway, Pitless Pontiff, play it, especially in your Orzhov decks. Um, a little harder to splash for in... You know, your Azorius decks don't want to do this particular thing that much, but Rakdos decks, I can see, 
um, happily sacking a few creatures to the Pitiless Pontiff. Uh, Plague White is a generic mana and a black for a 2-1 common zombie. When it becomes blocked, each creature blocking gets minus 1, minus 1 to lend a turn. Really hard for your opponent to block. They cannot chump it with X1s, because that X1 will die before doing damage. Um, for that reason, for 2-drop for Plague White, I'm happy including this um, for, for for my particular for a Rakdos deck, for an Orzhov deck. Very happy with including a Plague White, because can't be chumped. Not only that, but it, your opponent also can't block it with 1Xs as well, with the one fours, okay, it becomes a, a zero three. Yes, yours doesn't die, but neither does the Plague White, right? So keep that in mind um, when you're attacking as well, it subtracts power as well as toughness. Priest of the Forgotten Gods is a generic man in a black for a rare human cleric, uh, it is a one two, uh, has tap, sacrifice two other creatures, any number of target players, each lose two life, and sacrifice a creature. You add two black mana and draw a card. So it, you target the players, so if the player is hexproof, you can't do it. So keep in mind if your opponent has that gruel hexproof card, can't do this on their turn. Just be careful. Um, any number does mean zero, so if you accidentally do this on their turn, you don't have to pick yourself. Um, but be careful with it still. But this is good in your Orzhov. If you get, get really heavy Orzhov or Mardu tokens, this is going to be good in there. Um, if that Mardu Tokens deck becomes a deck in standard, this finds a spot in there pretty easily because it sets off your aristocrat strategy of sacking creatures. It lets you draw, card and, draw cards and add mana and makes your opponent sacrifice creature, which if you're playing against some kind of big ramp stompy deck, will eventually run your opponent out of creatures. And obviously if I'm talking about in standard, play it in your Mardu decks in your Mardu and your Orzhov decks in limited as well. Rakdos Trumpeter is one generic mana and a black for a common human shaman. It is a 1-3 with menace, and it's three generic mana and a red to give it plus 2 plus 0 oh until end of turn. Um, so you can play this turn 2, attack with it turn 3, you do 1, maybe your opponent doesn't have two blockers yet, and then turn 4, if your opponent still only has one blocker, you can start getting in there for 3 and 3 and 3. So it's kind of punishes your opponent for not getting out there quickly. Uh, could be really good against some, some particular, particularly slow um, Azorius or Simic decks that maybe miss a land drop or two, but I wouldn't be shy about including a Rakdos Trumpeter as well. Good aggressive creature. So we have our first Orzhov split card. We have Revival, for a two hybrid Orzhov mana, so black or white and black or white, for a rare sorcery, return target creature card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So that is just fine on its own. You get to do your afterlife creature twice. Um, you get to do, if you can get more value off that, awesome. For me, even, like worst case, you get a death touch creature back. You get uh, a cheap little afterlife creature back. You get your little one mana, uh, dog doggo protector guy back um the nice thing is that it's not to your hand it's directly onto the battlefield um the other half being revenge also good for generic mana a white and a black for a rare sorcery both of these are sorceries most of the other ones we've seen have been split between incident and sorcery but these are both sorceries uh so for four generic mana a white and a black you can double your life total target opponent loses half their life rounded up um, so late game, especially in board stalls, this can give you the buffer you need to be like, okay, I'm at 24 now, uh, opponent is now at 4. Okay, I have enough room to get in there with my creatures, put them to 2, uh, then I can survive the, the crack back for 10, um, and then their creatures will be tapped, it just puts your opponent on the back foot and kind of can just push that last little bit over the edge. But I am very happy with both copies. Uh, both sides of Revival and Revenge. Jane Austen's Revival and Revenge. So, um, Rakdos is very happy to both... You're going to be able to return a lot more creatures with the Revival half out of Rakdos um, than you are out of Azorius, potentially. A lot more creatures that matter. Um, Revenge, as well, also going to be good in Rakdos if you're splashing white. Um, Azorius would be fine, because Azorius will get into a lot of those board stall states as well, where this will also matter. Um, so yeah, Revenge, Revival and Revenge, play it in either colors if you're playing Rakdos, Azorius, or of course Orzhov. Seraph of the Scales, ooh, yes please, yes please, all of the yes. 
So Seraph of the Scales, two generic mana, a white and a black for a mythic angel who's a 4-3. Uh, it has flying and also several abilities. It has white, Seraph of the Scale gains vigilance till end turn. Pay a black, Seraph of the Scale gains death touch till end turn, and has afterlife 2. So downsides to the card, 3 toughness. Can die to a lot of things. Plop side to the card, has afterlife 2. If it dies, you just you can you get two spirits. Oh no. Um like we've talked about, there's plenty of recursion spells in black in this. Even in sealed and and draft, you're gonna be able to get this back. Um, you can give her vigilance. You can gain her, give her death touch if you happen to run into a bigger flyer or want to just need to block their big stompy thing on the ground. Seraph of the Scales can get in there and just kill it. Um, she can get vigilance so that she can attack freely and so we block her. Again, do not underestimate vigilance in a limited environment. Um, always good to check that out. But where we're gonna I don't know. Uh, it's a good value card. It, it has afterlife, but other than having afterlife, is not a great synergy with just the um, the aristocrat strategy, the Mardu aristocrat strategy. So that's where we have to start asking ourselves: Is this an auto included in there? Because we we need sack outlets. We need things that do damage when things die. Um, we need removal. And Seraph of the Scales just doesn't fit really, really well into any one of those any one of those canals. So that's where we have to start thinking about what exactly do we want to do. And she doesn't quite fit into there. Uh, just good value creature, but think we're gonna have three three damage burn spells in standard all at once, plus things like Lava Coil that would even just counter the afterlife ability. So potentially not not in this unfortunately for standard um again this is one of those edge case ones where it might be but i'm leaning towards probably no on this one obviously limited sealed bomb yes just player just not quite in standard i don't think spawn of mayhem however uh is two generic men and two black for a mythic demon uh is a four four with flying and trample has at the beginning of your upkeep spawn of mayhem deals one damage to each player so you included then if you have 10 or less life, put a plus one plus one counter on Spawn of Mayhem. So plus one plus one counters keep going. So if you have 10 or less life, so if you get dinged, okay, 11 down to 10. Do you have 10 or less life? Yes, it gets a counter. You can ding down to nine. Do you have 10 or less life? Yes, it gets a counter. Uh, in addition to all that, it also has a spectacle cost of generic black black. For three mana, you can play Spawn of Mayhem. That seems real good. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I think that seems real good. Um, we've seen similar effects now. Keep in mind, Spawn won't get bigger. It's not a Desecration Demon. It is not. Um, we've seen effects like this before, where these big flying demons get bigger and bigger and bigger. This won't for a while. Unless you're really low life, this doesn't get much bigger. But even just for value, a 4-4 flying trample for 4, I will play that. Never mind for 3. Um... This just might get into a... I've also talked, if you've been on streams in the past, with... I've actually talked with, with Shane. Sorry, the camera used to be over here. Now it's over here. I gotta get used to that. Um, about just jund pile of good cards I own being a deck. And the Spawn of Mayhem gets in there easily. Uh, just on value-based jund, even if you look at modern. I'm not talking about this in modern, because it's not going to get there. Um, but even just in modern, jund is just a pile of the best value in these three colors. You know, Tarmogoyf, Bolts, um, Liliana, all kinds of that stuff. It's just been the best value in those colors. Here are a pile of those cards. Um, and in standard, this could get into a similar shell. Spire Mangler. Two generic mana and a black for a uncommon insect, 2-1, uh, flash and flying. When it enters the battlefield, target creature with flying uh, you control gets plus 2 plus 0 oh, until the end of turn. So it can give itself plus two plus oh until end of turn. Flash enters the battlefield. It can block an X four uh, because it can make itself into a four one and just one shot kind of kill that. I look at this. They see if I'm holding up three mana, pass my opponent. Opponent's like, okay, uh, here's a little ground creature. I'm like, okay, you didn't play a flyer. Okay, Spire Mangler on the end of their turn, uh, just for value to have a two one flyer that can get in there. Turn four, turn four, turn five, whatever. Um, if they start to, if they're really aggressive, if they have like a red, black with some dragons or something, or some flyers, um, I can play this at flash as a blocker on their turn when they attack and kill whatever X4 they're attacking me with. So there's a number of versatile ways where you can play with this. I like it because of that. Um, 
So yeah, anytime you can get multiple choices and there's multiple instances to play a card where it's fine, not, you know, this isn't going to win you the game, probably, or it's fine, uh, card's good on turn three, card's good on turn five, six, seven to kill an opponent's creature, any one of those. So I would probably play one Spire Mangler, because black um, can be a little weak to flying sometimes. It'll get some, as we've seen, right? Um, but it doesn't have as much as other colors, so... Anytime I can get a flyer in kind of a color like this, I'm probably going to do it. Syndicate Guild Mage, or Orzhov Guild Mage now, third of the five we'll see today, is a white man and a black mana for an uncommon human cleric. It's a 2-2, two -two. has a couple of abilities, like the rest of them, has a generic and a white to tap, tar uh, tap it, and tap target creature with power 4 or greater. Uh, also has four generic mana and a black, tap it, Syndicate Guild Mage deals two damage target opponent or a planeswalker. So it kind of has a Demir ability from last set and a Boros ability from last set. Because this can ping, you. it's a very expensive way, but it is a way to set off um, uh, Spectacle for your Rakdos cards. Uh, it's also just a good way to get blockers out of the way. You can do it defensively on your opponent's uh, upkeep. You can do it offensively on your turn to get rid of their, uh, rid of their blockers. You can do it on both to get rid of two of their blockers. You know, do it on their upkeep, do it on your um, main phase, tap one of their blockers down, and all of a sudden two of their blockers are down, you can get in there with whatever you want to get in there with. Um, late game board stall, the second ability is going to really come into play. Ring just two, two, two. There you're done. You've done six damage over three turns. That's about a third of your opponent's life total. And that's just going to be enough sometimes. So, Syndicate Guild Mage ranks towards the, the higher end for myself. In guild mages, uh, like most of the guild mages, though, if you're anywhere near either of these colors, play it. Um, I would even of Syndicate guild mage in particular, I would even play multiples, because with one of them you can tap something down, with another one you can shock. You know, just it's it, this one's good with if you have a couple of them. I would say. Tasa Karlov. Mm, yep, 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 yep. Anyway, two generic mana, a white and a black for a two-four, uh, rare and legendary human advisor. If a creature dying causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability, ability triggers an additional time. Creature tokens you control have Vigilance and Lifelink. Here is one of the cornerstones of the potential Aristocrats deck. Um, because if you have, let's say, Poison Tip Archer, whenever a creature dies, an opponent loses one life. Um, there's a similar uh, the Drain and Gain card in this set, uh, with a Blood Artist type effect. Uh, Tesa causes those abilities to trigger twice. So when an opponent, or sorry, when a creature you control dies, sorry, uh, any creature dies, and if you control a Poison Tip Archer, for instance, because we just know about that card right now, we haven't run into the other one yet. Uh, so when a Poison Tip Archer, um, when a creature dies, Poison Tip Archer, hey, something died, I'm going to do a damage. So that's a triggered ability of due to a permanent uh, dying, a creature dying, a permanent you control triggered, so that would trigger an additional time, so it would do two damage, right? So just because a creature died, Poison of Archer's gonna do two damage. Um, this is real good, if you have a couple of Poison of Archer's out, if you have a couple of the new creatures out, this, there are, uh, in standard, once allegiance come out, there'll be eight that you can have in a deck. If you have two out, one creature dying does four damage to your opponent. That's really good. Um, and if you just complement that with other, with removal spells, with other sacrifice outlets, with value off of death that can come out of the Mardu color combination, um, it's really good. I'm aware Poison of Archer is green. That's why it might have to be four color. But I want to make it happen. Okay. Uh, also, Tesa gives creature tokens you control, Vigilance, and Life Lake. So all your spirits are gaining you life in addition to going over. And even if they run into something and die, that's fine. You gained life and your opponent's gonna lose life because stuff died. And um, and obviously, if I'm talking about it in standard, yes, can do it in limited, do it in drafts. Tesa, do it all day long. Thirsting Shade. Just like me for Tesa, thirst. Anyway, <laughs> uh, black mana for a common shade. Uh, there's a 1-1 one, one lifelink, and as most shades do, you can pay to pump it. This one is too generic and a black. It gets plus 1, plus 1 till end of turn, and you can do that as many times as you can afford to or want to. So, this is a solid 1-drop, one 1-drop, one lifelink 1-1. One, one. Uh, you can sink man into it later. It's, it is an expensive rate. I would not do more than 1. This isn't the same as the other shade that just costs 2. Uh, 2 is a much better rate. Uh, 
or even the, the triple black shade that was a 3-3 three, three, uh, that you could just pay a single black to pump it. That's the best case, but there's things shade I would play uh, a copy of. This is the kind of thing that will help you um, gain life in order to pay for that enchantment we talked about earlier. But one of maybe, but not much more than that. Undercity Scavenger is three generic mana and a black for a common ogre warrior. It is a 3-3, three, three, and when it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature if you do, but two 1-1 one, one counters on Undercity Scavenger, then scry two. Um, this, if you're playing Orshav, this is going to be one of your potential sack outlets. Uh, nice thing about this is when it comes in, you can sack something, but then it will also pump this card. Um, getting bigger creatures, bigger power creatures in Orzhov is one area where we've had a little struggle with before. Um, but Undercity Scavenger could be... I play a couple of these guys pretty easily um, in, my, in my limited deck. My draft deck for sure as well. You need to get the creatures to sack to this first, but this is one of your better sack outlets. But Undercity Scavenger is something I'd include a pair of in my in my sealed deck or my draft deck. Not much more than that, but easily a pair. <laughs> uh, Undercity's Embrace is two generic mana and a black for a common instant. Target opponent sacrifices a creature. If you control a creature with power four or greater, you gain four life. Um, again, another good way to get rid of hexproof creatures. Of course, if your opponent has multiple creatures, they're going to sack the worst of those. Um, it's instant, though, so the neat thing about this, this effect, uh, I don't think this effect has been instant for a long time. Um, the neat thing about this is if your opponent casts a creature and is about to have two creatures on the board, but the other one's really good, you can just say, in response to that, I want you to sacrifice that one you already have, right? Um, and if that on its own is good, never mind the ferocious ability that they stable onto a few of these cards, you can potentially gain four life if you have a big creature out as well. Um, Undercity's Embrace, splash it in anything you can splash it in. It's just going to be, be value for you. Vindictive Vampire is our final black slash Orzhov card. It is a three generic mana and a black for an uncommon vampire. It's a two three. It says whenever another creature you control dies, Vindictive Vampire deals one damage to each opponent and you gain one life. So this is the other card I was talking about earlier where you can sack something uh, to drain and gain your opponent. Uh, it's not a poison tip archer, doesn't count your opponent's creatures, but still, uh, if you board wipe with this on the board and you have a bunch of creatures or tokens or whatever, this is going to ping your opponent for one and swing you up one for each of those creatures other than itself. It says another creature, so other than itself. But if poison tip cre poison tip archer says another creature as well, so it won't count itself either. But still, um, with the amount of tokens you're hopefully going to have from being Mardu, um, Vindictive Vampire could very easily pay off in a decent sized life swing. Um, and I'm always good for that. I love this kind of effect in Orzhov and Rakdos as well. Uh, so ideally in Mardu, you're going to have this kind of thing happen a lot. So if you're playing Rakdos, you want to play this. If you're playing Orzhov, you want to play this. Not a ton of other colors are going to have this happen a lot. So in those two colors, Rakdos, Orzhov, or those two combinations, for sure. Outside of that, I don't see it playing it too, too much. But that is our third color combo. We're, we're going to have five, and then a quick little um, show of the lands and artifacts, but there's not too many of those. So we're going to go back into uh, our red and Rakdos. We're going to save Gruul for last. There we are. Start off with an oldie but a goodie. I love this art, too. This is so cool. He's wearing a Rakdos mask. So first off is Act of Treason. It's two generic mana and a red. For a common source, it says gain control of target creature until the end of turn. 